Uh, we will review all the questions from participants and that will be answered during the Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. So uh, we'll do the presentations first and then get to the Q&A parts, but you can ask, ask the question at any point during the webinar. Um, next slide, please. Um, to see a list of the participants, you can click on the participants button again in the bottom panel. Uh, and if you want to raise a hand or if you have any reactions, there's a button on the bottom panel as well for those reactions. Um, next slide, please. Uh, if you have any technical issues with Zoom, uh, again, please use the chat function um, and send a direct message to the two hosts. The two hosts are Monica Doble uh, and Eric Schulman. So if you send a message to Monica, she'll try to resolve the any technical issues that you might have. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, just a brief overview of today's webinar. Um, I will introduce the speakers, as I mentioned. Um, Sam Tyson with Federal Highway Administration will give you a brief, will uh, provide a brief introduction and give you some background regarding the everyday six, everyday counts, six targeted overlay pavement solutions program. And followed by that, we'll have two speakers uh, from uh, CP. I couldn't have asked for two better speakers for this program. Most of you know them uh, very well. Peter Taylor from the National Concrete Pavement Technology Center and Gary Fick from Transtech. And I will introduce them uh, later on in the program and we'll follow that by the Q&A. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Sam Tyson. Um, most of you don't need any introduction to Sam Tyson, but Sam is a concrete pavement engineer with the Federal Highway Administration uh, with the Office of Pre-Construction, Construction and Pavements out of Washington, DC. Uh, he uh, actually runs the, the Federal Highways Program to advance best practices for construction, rapid repair and rehabilitation of concrete pavements. Uh, and is leading Federal Highways effort to increase the use of concrete overlays uh, to extend performance of both existing asphalt and existing concrete pavements. Uh, so Sam uh, is a registered professional engineer in DC, District of Columbia, and a graduate of the University of Virginia. Uh, Sam, please take it away. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Shri. Um, as you can see on the slide, uh, Tim Ashenbrenner from FHW headquarters and Derek Niener Plant from FHW Resource Center are on the asphalt team. Uh, on the concrete side, of course, as Sri mentioned, I am uh, at, at the headquarters, along with uh, help from Bob Conway in the uh, FHWA Resource Center. So that's extremely helpful to me. Uh, next slide. I was probably surprised a bit myself, and some of you may be, that over 25% of all state DOT infrastructure funds go to pavement overlays. Now this is both asphalt and concrete. Uh, given the fact that uh, state DOTs manage 2.8 million miles of pavements, maybe this is not particularly surprising, but states do have to uh, prioritize their funds and look at the most important uh, use of each dollar that they receive. Next slide. And, and this leads us into how is the uh, uh, TOPS management of uh, pavements uh, different from uh, typical overlays. And really they're not in terms of the technical process in which they're applied. They're different in the process of determining what the priority is for the use of the overlays. Uh, high priority pavements, pavements that simply cannot be uh, taken out of service for an extended period of time. So the difference is really in the process of selecting which pavements get the overlays first. Uh, next slide. Our mission with the TOPS program, of course, is to extend pavement life, to take existing pavements, both asphalt and concrete, in the case of concrete overlays, and overlay them to preserve the existing investment in the pavement that uh, is in place uh, with as little maintenance as possible on that pavement. 
which gives you the ability to uh, uh, the, the DOTs, the ability to uh, both save money uh, and to deliver the targeted uh, pavement in uh, the most economical and the most uh, environmentally sound manner. Next slide. Our goals uh, for the ED6 uh, program really are to uh, reinforce the use of concrete pavements for the DOTs that use them already, uh, perhaps not to the extent that they might use them in, in total, and to introduce uh, other states that are, excuse me, turned off my cell phone, uh, introduce other states to uh, the use of concrete overlays if they're not using them currently because they can actually save a lot of money, save a lot of time, and preserve a lot of existing pavements for extended use through the use of concrete overlays. Next slide. When we look at what's in the toolbox for concrete overlay products, it's really pretty straightforward for both asphalt and concrete. There's a bonded and an unbonded process of applying concrete overlay. Uh, both Peter and Gary will get into some detail in how this is accomplished. I would just say that from the standpoint of concrete overlays, the unbonded overlay is probably uh, the greatest percentage, maybe 60 or 70% of, of, of concrete overlays are unbonded uh, for performance issues. But again, I'll let Peter and Gary get into the details of those applications. Uh, next slide. Since the TOPS program includes asphalt as well, we should look at what's in the uh, asphalt toolbox. Uh, Tim Ashenbrenner is going to, in a future webinar, talk about this in detail. But if you look down the list of asphalt overlay products, there are, uh, what, two, four, six, eight listed uh, that uh, Gary, will, um, uh, Tim, rather, will talk about in some detail. So uh, we've got both concrete and asphalt overlays that are available for your use. And we're looking to increase the use of those uh, uh, products through the TOPS program. Next slide. The ultimate goal is to improve safety, improve performance, long-term performance, uh, retain the investment in the existing asphalt and concrete pavements by overlaying them, saving money, of course, and doing it all in an environmentally sound manner. So with that, I'll give it back to Sri, and Sri will introduce the uh, next speakers. Um, thank you very much, Sam, for the introduction to the TOPS program. Uh, so we'll start with the main part of today's agenda. And our first speaker is Peter Taylor from the National Concrete Pavement Technology Center at Iowa State University. Uh, I couldn't have asked for two better speakers to talk about concrete overlays. Um, uh, Gary Fick and Peter Taylor literally wrote the book on concrete overlays, and that's just not that's not just a, uh, uh, an expression. It it is actually true. Um, so Peter is the director of the National Concrete Pavement Technology Center at Iowa State University. Uh, he's been involved in conducting projects and programs. Um, in uh, regarding concrete pavements and spends a lot of time helping agencies and contractors uh, implement best practices in concrete pavement design, construction, and maintenance. Uh, he also conducts a lot of research that's focused on developing mixtures uh, that are engineered to meet requirements of the environment that they will be used in. Um, he's a professional engineer registered in Illinois and is an active member of many professional societies. Um, we're really glad to have you, Peter, uh, and present in today's webinar. Peter, take it away. Great. Thanks very much, Sri. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to uh, join you on this session and talk about a topic that we're pretty passionate about. Uh, and it's also great to be teaming up with Gary, is that uh, 
I'm, I bring the theory and get, Gary brings, how, how do I actually do it in the real life? So uh, I've got about 30 slides to go through. So let's get started. What I'm gonna be providing is basically a motivation, uh, the value proposition uh, of why we should be thinking about overlays. A lot of the material actually comes from a publication that Tom Cackler developed for us uh, and has been published on the CP Tech website. Um, the topics I'm going to be covering include, you know, what's the issue? Why do we bother talking about it? Uh, Sam has already alluded to some of the questions that we're trying to address. The value proposition, the barriers we need to get past, why people don't do it all the time everywhere, how to get started. And then uh, Gary will pick up on uh, some, pro some successful projects that we've run in the past and some resources that are available to you as potential users. All right, next slide. Okay, so for those of you that work for agencies, departments of transportation, cities, counties, I've yet to hear anybody representing those organizations say to me that they've got more money than they can use. Everybody is running on extremely tight budgets. They're trying to do more with less and working very hard to maintain and upgrade the uh, pavement systems that they have under their jurisdiction. The bad news is that it's always deteriorating. The anytime that you put something that lives outdoors, the weather is gonna beat it up, the traffic is gonna beat it up, <coughs> and it will start to decay at different rates over a period of time. At the same time, the traffic's getting bigger, uh, the traveling pub public is getting more fussy about ride quality, and uh, they're also getting far more fussy about continuous access to their roadways, uh, particularly, you know, I live in Iowa, uh, predominantly a farming community, and if you close down a road so that the farmer can't get his uh, plant onto the question, onto, you know, from his farm to the point of delivery, He's going to come out and get very ugly with you as you're trying to work on the system. And so continuous access is a pretty big demand. And so in many ways, we, um, we're, we're effectively burning the candles at the both ends. We're asking more of far, with far less resources in, at our availability. Next slide. So we have an existing pavement system. It's a lot of it is actually getting pretty old. I mean, the Eisenhower system was built in the 60s and 70s. That's 40, 50, 60 years old. And some of it's starting to get a little tired. And it's not so surprising. And it well deserves to, to be tired. It's survived very well and remarkably well uh, over the period of time it's been exposed. So when you as an agency start to look at it and say, OK, we've got to do something about it. Let's review some of the choices that you have. One, a bit like we do in a lot of our other uh, activities, if you know, my cell phone gets more than a couple years old, I throw it away or at least recycle it so we can get the lithium out of the battery and go and get a new one. Now it's kind of tough to pick up 30 miles of pavement and take it into a store and say, give me another one. And it, it's, it's an effective approach to say, it, well, let's beat it up, take it out and remove it and replace it from the point of view that it's a long-term solution. You can buy another 40, 50 years uh, with the product that you're putting down, but the negatives are not trivial. You have a disposal headache. There's a lot of material for, on every mile of existing pavement. You lose a lot of equity in the existing system. That's not economically sound, nor is it sustainably sound, is that if you've got a good system in place that needs some minor treatment, it, it's an awful waste and an awful carbon foot uh, load uh, to simply throw it away. It also takes time and energy and money to do this re removal and replacement. And at the same time, the other one we're starting to pay more attention to is this whole idea of safety. Is that if you shut down a road, 
the, the several months that it takes to beat it out and replace it, traffic on the other roads, or if you're building under traffic, safety becomes a real issue. Uh, and I've been encouraging my safety colleagues to start looking at this idea of uh, a life cycle safety, as well as life cycle cost and life cycle environmental impacts. So all of those things in red may be considered negatives for this solution. Next slide here. So then we can also go to the other extreme and say, well, let's just patch it. It's very limited in the amount of materials that you use. In this photograph, we've got the joints have started to fall apart, but the rest of the slabs are actually in really good shape. And so let's just do something with the joints. And uh, this is not a bad solution if you want a, a reasonably short-term answer. Generally, patches don't last, particularly partial depth patches, don't last as long as the original pavement. So they might buy you five years while you raise the money to do a repair. There's also the aesthetic in this town. The chief, the, the city engineer was pretty excited about the fact that his, his roads look so ugly in the condition that they were in, having been patched the way they were. So yeah, limited usage, limited energy, limited traffic impact, but it's not a long-term solution. What else have we got? Next slide. And that's where we turn to this concept of using overlays. We do make use of the existing equity, is that the system that's in place, we don't remove, we build on top of it. It makes a very good foundation for the new layer that we're gonna be putting on top of it. And it means that we may be able to reduce the amount of material in this new layer because it is sitting on a pretty good system. It minimizes the sustainability impacts, again, because we're reducing the amount of materials that we're having to put into place and replace, uh, that, that's, a good, that's a good benefit. Can be a long-term solution, or if you're only looking for a few years, we can also tune it to be a short-term. So again, it's very flexible. You tell us how long you want it to last, we can design a system that will last for that length or maybe more. Um, the biggest challenge with this is that in you know, Midwestern Corn Belt farm roads, you don't really care if you add another few inches onto the top of an existing system. Uh, but if you're working in urban or city-based environments, the elevations, the connections to the side drains, um, the manholes getting under the multiple bridges that we drive under every day in our commute, those can be interesting. And we do have to stop and think about that. There are solutions for all of these issues and we have published about those, but it's not just a slam dunk and we do have to think about it. So in this slide, we've got more green than red. That sounds pretty promising. Let's keep going. Next slide. Okay, so let's look at this idea of you know, Sam has already alluded to a toolbox, and that's what we're trying to present to you, particularly for those of you who haven't thought about this before. Concrete overlays may not be applicable everywhere, but they should be something that you think about in a lot of cases. They extend life, they restore ride, they increase capacity, and they can be applied onto a fairly wide range of existing systems. This photograph was a site that I went to that was undergoing an overlay treatment. And you can see the condition of it. Uh, and not a lot of pre-treatment was being applied to this. So yeah, we think it has benefits of being cost-effective, sustainable, and uh, providing what agencies need to keep their systems up and running. Next. All right, what do they cost? How do they perform? What are the environmental impacts? We'll touch on each of these in the next few slides. Basically, there's, there's been a fairly significant growth in the amount of overlays being placed, particularly since 2005, since we started uh, uh, talking about this. There was a bit of a dip in 2020, uh, and I think that's more related to COVID and budgets than uh, popularity of the system. So next slide. How much does it cost? People often ask us this, and we generally try and avoid that question. Uh, it's politically incorrect, um, but here are some data that we did collect is that you're looking at about four to five dollars per square yard per 
inch thickness of concrete. Uh, but it's very dependent on where you are, what sort of industry, what sort of construction uh, community that are familiar with the game in place, what are the costs and materials for you locally. Um, but the message that we're trying to portray here is that it can be very competitive and it's well worth looking at this from a cost point of view. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, the other one is, and this is just an image that I stole from MIT, is that <coughs> you know, one of the messages that's out there is that if you have an asphalt community and a concrete community, that competition between the two different systems actually helps you as the user. We found that the single uh, material communities tend to be paying more because there is less competition. Therefore, if you're paying less, because of better competition, you're, you're spending less dollars to maintain your network condition. And again, there's a bunch of material available from MIT to support the, this contention. Next slide. Environmental impacts, we think, are pretty, pretty strong. A long life, meaning you don't have to replace it every few years. If you can go in every 40 years instead of every 10 years, that's a quarter of the amount of material that you're, you're, you're fooling with. It's also the a quarter of the amount of traffic delays. Um, so, you know, those together have a fairly substantial impact on reducing environmental impact. Uh, there is work out there indicating that a concrete pavement, particularly under track traffic, does uh, cause the vehicles to burn less fuel. And that's a benefit. Uh, the, the high albedo, particularly early on in the age of the pavement, uh, reduces the heat element effect and uh, light reflect uh, lighting that needs to be provided. The other sustainable part of it that we like to talk about is that concrete is fully recyclable. There are many sites around here where all of the, if an old pavement has been recycled or replaced, all of that material doesn't move far. In fact, there's machines that walk up and down our street, our, our, our roadways that dig out the old concrete, um, recycle it back into the base, and it doesn't move more than 20 or 30 feet. So recycling is a, a big part of our conversation. There's also some discussion about the idea that concrete will absorb CO2, so it actually may reduce its overall carbon footprint, and that one is still uh, under investigation by the research community. Okay, next. Resiliency is the other uh, fashionable term that's starting to get our attention as engineers. This concept that if we have a disaster, how long does it take us to get back and functioning? And this is not a trivial question. Here in Iowa, we have a Missouri River on one border and the Mississippi River on the other border. And it wasn't long ago, both of those rivers were under significant flood and a large amount of our farming community and many roads were inundated for several months. Whole towns had to be evacuated and stay evacuated because they were flooded by these two rivers. Um, and in fact, you know, just watching the news right at the moment, um, disasters happening on the island of Tonga sort of wonder if they're ever going to be able to recover because of both the volcano ash that's been dumped on them and uh, the, the tidal wave that came and swept over them. That place is in trouble. And so it's not trivial for us to think a little bit about, okay, a disaster happens. How long is it going to take us to get back up and running? And the, the, the conversation is being focused around the fact that concrete being stiffer imposes lower stresses onto the foundation system. That means, and is far less uh, sensitive to the stiffness of the foundation system. That means you can put rescue vehicles back onto the pavement a whole lot earlier without causing damage. And again, that's not a trivial issue. We're actually working on a tech brief and hope to have that published in the next month or two. So sensitivity subgrade softening is markedly reduced. Okay, next slide. So is this a newfangled thing that we're talking about? Nope, 
we've been building overlays since 1901. There's about 2,000 miles of overlays in service in Iowa. And again, a large, no, large number of them have been built in more recent years. But there's, there's more than 100 years of experience on how to do this. So let's look at some of these. Next slide. How well do they perform? Well, that's a bit like the economics question. And I'll give you an economics answer. It all depends. It depends on the thickness of the pavement of the overlay that you put down. It depends on the condition of the existing pavement that you're placing it on top. It also depends, like anything else that we do in our engineering world, the devil is in the details. Are you getting the right details in place for the environment that you have, for the conditions and traffic that you have, and for the to, to address the condition of the existing pavement? And uh, Sam alluded a little earlier to this idea of bonded and unbonded. The, the real difference between these two approaches and why we, we uh, talk about them both is that unbond, if we put down an unbonded system, it's typically placed on a pave, an existing pavement that's in a fair amount of trouble. We, un, we, we separate the two layers because we don't want any uh, cracking or other damage to reflect through the new layer. So we allow the two different systems to move independently, uh, which means then that the upper layer has to be uh, thicker to be able to be structurally competent to carry the loads. If we go with a bonded layer, then we're getting the structural benefit of that lower system because they move together. But Moving together means that the risk of reflective cracking is fairly high. And it also means that we have to be pretty sure of that bond. Because if the bond is less than we assumed at the design stage, then we've got one layer that's thinner than it should be, and the potential for failure goes up a little bit. And Sam alluded to the fact that most overlays that we're putting down at the moment are unbonded. And that's partially because they're a little easier to work with, uh, and they are known to be very reliable. The data in the plot that I have up on the screen there is from some data we collected here in Iowa. I think these were 12 foot panels, seven to eight, eight inch thick sections. Uh, and, and you can see that if we draw a straight line graph through these things, we're getting 30, 40 years out of them without any trouble at all. Um, now, what we do find at the bottom of that plot, there is uh, some systems which have not performed as well. We actually went back in and had a look at those pavements and it turned out that there was always some sort of issue with inappropriate design, uh, that the construction wasn't the quality that we wanted or that the materials were not as specified. So, you know, the premature failures are substandard, but if we manage to build everything according to the way that it should be done, we can really get a good long life out of these systems if we want them. Next slide. Versatility, they can be applied on all sorts of surface types. Uh, we can accommodate all sorts of distress. And again, that becomes part of the thought process. Is the first question is, am I, am I building on top of asphalt or am I building on top of concrete? Well, that's easy to answer. You go outside and kick it. Then you do the question of, is my existing pavement in good shape or is it in trouble? If it's in trouble, we will probably consider an unbounded layer. If it's in pretty good shape and what we're trying to do is to uh, increase capacity or do a widening or to deal with joint issues, then we can consider a bonded layer. Uh, and so again, we can cope with all sorts of trouble. It just takes a little bit of thinking to make the wise decisions. They've been used roads, intersections, parking lots, airfields. Um, you know, it's not just limited to farm fields. You know, we can do, use these systems almost anywhere. All right, next slide. Can be really relatively quick. Uh, is that if you're putting down a six inch section or even thinner, you move pretty fast. You can put a fairly big machine on top of it, a 35, 30 foot paving machine. You can be in and out of a neighborhood relatively quickly. Um, you're also not really affected by the weather. 
And we're starting to figure out how we can get traffic back onto this pavement within a weekend, uh, particularly for residential traffic. I live in a cul-de-sac. All of my neighbors are grumpy old professors. And when the city started talking about refurbishing the street, that was the message that the city engineer got. We want to be able to go home tonight. And we managed to compromise it that, yeah, we'll get home in a couple of days. And uh, so I was pushing hard for concrete. I didn't succeed. But even so, we do believe this can be done uh, without much disruption to the, the local residents. Next slide. There is always, anytime we have traffic and we have construction, there is an impact. And it's something we have to pay attention to. Uh, you know, we always joke about two seasons, snow and construction, either one of us slowing, either one of those slowing us down. Um, but we can build under traffic. The photograph is from a test section that we built here in Northern Iowa, where it was, where, we deliberately built it with traffic still flowing through the construction section. It, it meant a lot of management in terms of how we were only allowed to close down a couple of miles of the road at a time. Uh, traffic control with traffic lights and pilot cars uh, was fairly involved, but we did it. Uh, and uh, there were no accidents um, and uh, it, it can be done. Uh, Early opening is also possible. I've alluded to that. Is that if we need to get particularly residential grade traffic on back onto the, the new roadway pretty quickly, that can be negotiated. All right, next slide. I've put the heading in here of effectiveness and just was a catch-all title for some of the things that we're doing a little bit different. We are using uh, uh, Ashto ME is able to address design of overlays. Now that bottoms out at about six inches. So if you've got very little traffic, you may want to look at other design tools and there are other tools out there and Gary uh, can uh, talk to those. And I think Shri has a lot of expertise in that world as well. We can optimize the mixtures. Again, that's work that I've been doing, looking at can we make a mixture that delivers what you want using far less cement, far less cementitious materials um, that we can reduce our environmental footprint without using a recipe-based mixture. Uh, the other uh, innovation is this idea of uh, stringless control. You can see there's a, a LIDAR or a, a total station parked behind the gator in the photograph and two poles sticking out the top of the paving machine. So that machine, there's no string line on this construction site. That machine is being controlled entirely by uh, the total station. And that actually means that you can be remarkably precise uh, with the control. So that again, instead of adding an inch onto the pavement because you're worried about getting the thickness bonus, we can narrow that error down and make our systems far more uh, efficient. We have large, very efficient, very adaptable paving machines. Machines that can do multiple uh, cross falls if we want to do the shoulders at the same time as the main cross fall, uh, as the main line, uh, and we can do full width if we have to. We can mount real-time smoothness measurement systems on the back so that we've got a far better control of, you know, knowing almost immediately what's coming out of the back of that paver in terms of the smoothness at the end of the day. And again, the world's expert on that topic is the next speaker in this webinar. We can also use tools like mat maturity to be able to keep an eye on what is the performance of this mixture? When can we open it back up to traffic? And we can shave that down from a rule of thumb, 24, 48 hours, if we've got the strength measured using maturity uh, and the traffic can get back on in eight, nine, 10 hours, that's a huge benefit for both the contractor and the local community. Next slide. We also talked, uh, I alluded to safety a little bit earlier, but again, the less that we have to shut systems down, the better the safety is for the, for the workers uh, and safety for the traveling public. Um, and also, you know, as somebody who hates getting trapped in traffic, um, 
it's really better for our blood pressure and our health all around. So again, getting in, fixing it, getting out is a real benefit to the community as a whole. Next. All right, so how do we do this? It's actually not very different from conventional concrete paving. We use the same machines. We use the same mixtures. All we're doing is putting a slightly thinner layer. Now, if we're using an unbonded system, we do have to think a little bit about how do we make sure that we get the unbonding that we want. The plan sets are simple. Uh, there's lots of materials and training and troubleshooting available, both from us, from uh, Gary Fick, from the TOPS team. Um, and so a lot of information is available to help you get on top of, of this sort of question. Next. Okay, so what are some of the challenges? Why don't we do more of this? And what we hear from the community is that we haven't thought about it before. It's not part of our conventional project management system. Innovation is hard. You know, as engineers, we're, we are risk averse, and particularly from an agency point of view, risk averse, because there's no upside to taking a risk and it going wrong. Um, but we believe that we can provide you with the resources to uh, help you understand that risk and uh, make decisions that may have fairly significant benefits in terms of cost, time, reliability, all of the things that I've been ran, rambling on about uh, for the last 30 minutes or so. All right, next slide. Many agencies focus on the surface condition only uh, and they're under you know, political pressure to you know, as many square feet or square yards or square miles as possible. The catch being with this is that a, a quick and dirty repair may also fall apart a little faster. And so that you may end up with a, a, a never ending cycle of uh, just playing catch up on repairing a system. And so we would encourage you to consider the full life cycle benefit. If I'm getting a 40 year system at a small increment of cost, are you not better off at the end of the day? And the other thing that we can consider with overlays is that if the surface is the part that's deteriorating, we can put an overlay on with a couple of inches extra material, which you can then go through and grind every 10 years or so, keep that friction resist uh, up uh, and still have plenty of structural capacity at the end of the day. Next. Difficulty is identifying candidate projects. And again, that's true. Uh, and uh, for people who haven't played before, we have to explore teams of experts who are able to come out, talk to you, to walk the pavement with you and to say, this is a good candidate or this is not. Now this photograph is a candidate, yeah, no, uh, it's a little too far gone. But anything better than that, we can probably make it work somehow. As I said, some of the other challenges include connections, dealing with getting under bridges, uh, the extra work you have to do in service access. <coughs> And again, we have a lot of solutions available. They're on our website. The, the tools are there. If you need help, feel free to give us a call. Next. What about traffic? Do we detour? Do we shut it down and get in and out? That's entirely up to you. And again, we can help you with that conversation. Uh, we can build an overlay pretty quickly, as I've already said, but it's also possible to build under traffic. In some ways, that's an economic decision. Uh, and it's also a conversation you have with whoever's living or working on that street. How long are they prepared to let you shut it down? Um, either option is available and uh, can be talked about it. A key part of all of this, what we found is that life gets a whole lot better when you spend effort on communicating and planning. I think one of the war stories that was really interesting is that when we were planning an overlay in a rural community, one of the farmers was really hot about not being able to get home at night. The solution at the end of the day, the contractor paid for him to stay in a hotel for the three days. So he didn't have to go to his farm at all. Uh, it was during uh, the fallow season 
Uh, and so, you know, just providing a simple solution like that was more than enough to keep an impacted homeowner <laughs> from being totally mad. So again, work with your contractors. They often have really good ideas on uh, how some of this stuff can be, be addressed. Next slide. How do I get started? I've never played before. Well, at, like anything that we do uh, in life, start simple. Pick a fairly short section, something that's not very complicated. Get help, and there's abundant help available, both from FHWA, from TOPS, from the CP Tech Center. Call us, we can be there. Uh, then once you've built it, keep an eye on it. How did it work out for you? Was it cost effective? Is it giving you the performance that you like? If so, then yes, let's build some competency. Let's get your construction community used to doing this kind of work. Let's get your consulting community used to doing the designs. Then you can build this process into your mix of fixes that you have for your system. And we've done this on more than one occasion on a number of agencies, both city, county, and state throughout the country. Next slide. So what do we do? As I already alluded to a little earlier, the first thing is identify what type of pavement you've got to work with. Well, that's not a hard decision. Assess the condition of the pavement. And then based on that, you can make a choice on how much effort do I have to put into restoring some functionality out of that existing pavement, or am I just gonna put a debonding layer and an unbonded concrete pavement on top? The debonding is in the form of a thin asphalt layer, typically about an inch, or we're getting more and more familiar with the idea of using uh, geotextile uh, cloth sections that go between the concrete and the existing pavement and provide that layer of separation, uh, the, the debonding, the, the shear separation. Um, and both of them work pretty well. And again, there's this environmental and uh, cost implications and time on doing both of these. Um, so the four different systems that we talk about at the moment, we changed the term, terminology about a year ago, is concrete on asphalt, bonded or unbonded, concrete on concrete, bonded or unbonded. And you know, basically the, the top layer, the differences are what have you got there and what is the condition of the existing system? Uh, next slide. And with that, I'm done. So I will hand the control back to uh, Sri and let him introduce Gary. All right, thank you very much, Peter. That was, that was excellent, excellent background on concrete overlays and really set, set the stage up well for Gary's presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions for Peter, uh, as I mentioned before in the beginning of the program, uh, please use the chat function and uh, send a message to me or to everyone and we'll get to the questions uh, in the Q&A portion of the program. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Gary Fick. Uh, when I asked Gary for a short bio, he literally gave me the shortest bio ever, a couple of sentences. But Gary's uh, name and, uh, and experience really uh, spans well past those two sentences. Uh, he's been uh, really doing concrete construction for over 30 years and many, many projects and uh, has also done a ton of concrete overlays across the country. Uh, he's currently a project manager at the Transtech Group. And as a project manager at Transtech Group, uh, he has worked with multiple contractors and and he's he, he didn't say it in his bio, but I'm gonna plug it in. It, uh, is, uh, he's the lead author for the uh, concrete overlay guide um, that is uh, produced by the CP Tech Center. Um, so without any further ado, um, please welcome Gary Fink. Gary? Thank you, Shri. Um... I'm gonna leave my video off. I've had some bandwidth challenges here lately at the office. And so um, I'll spare everybody having to look at my face just to be safe on the safe side uh, with regard to bandwidth, but um, appreciate the introduction, humbled by that. Um, so Peter's done an excellent job of outlining a framework for agencies to move forward with implementing concrete overlays. Now, Peter and I, I mean, 
So for over 15 years, he and I, along with the help of so many others, and, and those so many others basically taught me everything I know about overlays, and they've forgotten more than they taught me. Um, so a huge debt to all the other folks that have been with us over the last 15 years on the CP Tech Center's efforts towards implementation of concrete overlays. So part of those projects, and Peter mentioned this, I mean, we've got teams of experts that go out and, you know, boots on the ground and walk you through scoping a project. And um, I guess it's maybe we've had different mission statements all along or objectives, but from my perspective, I mean, the whole objective of, of us doing this, and I think TOPS is, is the, the perfect continuation of what's been happening, is to assist agencies with finding the appropriate application of concrete overlays for their pavement preservation strategies. Uh, and I'll be the first one to show up to scope a job and say, well, just this is just not appropriate for concrete overlay. I mean, it's, it's too far gone, or perhaps there's a better solution, a, a better preservation solution, and we still have an overlay down the road 10 years from now. Let's, let's squeeze everything we can out of this pavement before we have to overlay or remove or reconstruct. So I get the privilege of presenting some examples of concrete overlay projects from across the country. Uh, next slide. And we are literally just gonna hit the highlights. Um, I don't wanna get into the weeds on these. I, I think the intent here is for the audience to be able to look at, at these projects and say, hey, um, eh, that's similar to something we've got on our three-year program. Maybe we need to consider an, a concrete overlay solution on that. Maybe it's a potential strategy. So that, that's kind of the idea. It's not to get into the weeds and go through every single detail of these projects. So I, hopefully they're representative. I mean, there's there's some geographic and climatic distribution of these. Um, there's They vary from, gosh, six years old to, to 14 years old. There are other case studies out there on at the CP Tech Center's website where you'll find case studies of, of concrete overlays that are 30 years old. Okay. So these just happen to be, let's let's find something that's that's fairly recent, spans a wide variety. We've got different facility types. We've got different overlays, okay? So Peter just kind of went through those. We've got concrete on concrete unbonded. We've got concrete on asphalt bonded. And we've got concrete on asphalt unbonded. Varying levels of traffic volume and loading. And then different approaches to maintaining traffic during construction. So let's take a look at these projects one by one. Next slide. First one is North Carolina, Yadkin County on I-77. So constructed uh, 2007, 2008, it is concrete on concrete unbonded. The existing pavement, a 43 year old continuous reinforced pavement, okay? It was experiencing punch outs, ruptured steel, faulting at cracks. It, it obviously it was needing some attention. This uh, in North Carolina DOT chose design build delivery method on this, uh, that, that fits. I've seen plenty of overlay jobs that are design bid build. There's nothing you know, special that it has to be design build. This one just happened to be. Next slide. So when we talk about the maintenance of traffic on this job, obviously pretty heavy uh, use facility, lots of trucks, uh, lots of vehicles. So the approach was a median detour with limited duration of one lane operation. So most of the project main two, maintained two lanes in each direction. And the contractor was allowed some windows uh, where they were allowed to reduce down to one lane in a direction. The ramps also had some time frames. They had a, a maximum 11 day closure. Now, what's interesting about that is, is the design build RFP had those ramps um, constructed in asphalt. The contractor proposed unbonded concrete on concrete unbonded overlay for the ramps to save time. So they saw this as rapid construction. In fact, taking less time on the schedule with those 11 day closure limits uh, than an asphalt alternative would have. Typical section is 11 inch uh, JPCP, jointed plain concrete pavement on an inch and a half thick asphalt separation layer. Now, Really elegant solution to, and, and Peter mentioned this a couple times in, in his se section of the presentation of, you know, how do you do transitions? How do you match existing features? So the bridges on this project actually were um, able to be jacked 
to the overlay elevation. So they raised, raised the bridges by 12 and a half inches to match the 12 and a half inch raise and profile grade from the existing pavement. And then by specification, the entire surface of the concrete overlay was 100% ground. Uh, that was just a, a decision that was made in the design build RFP that uh, they wanted a ground surface for smoothness, for, for noise, whatever it was, but that's, that's the way that went. Next slide. So our second project is Colorado State Highway 13, kind of um, north, well, maybe central west. I guess you'd call it uh, western slope. Um, kind of dry count country out in uh, western Colorado. Existing pavement was asphalt. So we have a concrete on asphalt bonded overlay, the COAB. This asphalt was profile milled. So we're trying to optimize the volume of concrete and optimize the potential for pavement smoothness. So it's important to recognize that that profile milling process, so that involves collecting roadway, roadway profile data and then developing a proposed profile of the overlay, which given those two things, we're trying to find the best compromise between the potential for smoothness and volume of concrete that it's gonna take to get there. We, and we've got to maintain a minimum thickness of our overlay. We've designed for a certain number of uh, easels, traffic loading, whatever it is. Um, so we're, we're looking to find that, that best compromise of concrete thickness, volume of concrete, which is all boils down to cost. And then also being able to produce and, and construct a smooth pavement in the end. So the typical section on this job is six inches thick, again, jointed plain concrete pavement, with six foot by six foot slabs. Commonly referred to as a six by six by six. Colorado was kind of an innovator with uh, the six by six by six design. Uh, this project again was uh, 2016. It was also an alternate bid. So alternate bid um, concrete versus asphalt. And in this case, uh, concrete was lowest cost alternative. Next slide. Maintenance of traffic on this one, um, a little different than what you see sometimes. And we've got a six mile long pilot power operation. So we're maintaining traffic in both directions using a pilot car, constructing the overlay one lane at a time. Uh, the, the picture on the right, if you can see it, kind of shows that we've got pilot car and then and paver and on one side. Uh, final smoothness for this project, Average IRI was less than 45 inches a mile. So really complete success there. Next slide. Third project is Blaine County, Oklahoma State Highway 51, again, constructed in 2016. This was an existing asphalt pavement. And again, a concrete on asphalt bonded overlay application. This one was not bid alternate, but uh, went through a couple rounds of bid as an asphalt project and were rejected twice and then redesigned as a concrete overlay and, and finally awarded to that. Typical section is five inch thick fiber reinforced concrete. So again, jointed plain concrete pavement, six foot slabs uh, by seven and a half foot long. Again, this was profile milled. So the idea is, and you can see part of the roadway milled, um, Gentleman Neelan in the in the, the foreground here is um, actually the pavement was widened as well. I think a couple feet on each side. So those millings, part of them were utilized to, to widen as a sub base under the uh, concrete overlay. Um, so just out of coincidence, the guy in the foreground, you know, one of those people that have taught me so much over the years, uh, he and I worked together for 15 years, but uh, he has been doing concrete overlays since 1984. So and still doing it every day. Um, wealth of knowledge and, and uh, certainly appreciate all that he's taught me through the years. So maintenance of traffic on this one, um, you know, up to now we've kind of looked at different approaches for how do we get traffic through a job. This one was actually closed to through traffic. So let's get in here and, and get out as fast as we can, close the roadway to projects five and a half miles long to through traffic. Um, obviously, local traffic maintained so property owners can get into and out of their property. Next slide. 
So to do that, they, they you know, kind of segmented the project to where they could get people in one way, out the other way, um, but still have the road closed to through traffic. So if you think about 90 days, you know, this the second bullet project completed less than 90 days. So you go bid opening, project award, pre-work meeting, mobilization, construction of the over overlay, and then reopen to traffic all in less than 90 days. Um, whatever the terminology you want to use, whether it's, you know, rapid construction, accelerated construction, uh, it fits the bill. So my experience, first 15 years of my career was with a contractor and, and built a bunch of overlays and i can tell you that when you get to go to an overlay job it's like vacation you are not fighting the weather i mean literally unless it's snowing or raining you're paid um you're you're basically weatherproof and um it just shows up in in the production you can make and the, and the time savings that are available when we look at overlay solutions like this another thing you know i mentioned that the roadway was widened by a couple of feet on on each side so you can kind of see on the left there, all the drainage structures were extended to accommodate that, that uh, widened roadway. Next slide. Fourth project is uh, County Road in Iowa. So um, Worth County, very North Iowa, 23 miles long. So, I mean, this, you know, county is only 36 miles square. So um, most of a county, right? 23 miles long. It was an alternate bid. It was awarded the concrete based on uh, initial cost, a combination of initial cost and estimated life cycle cost, All right? The typical section is four inches thick. Again, JPCP, six foot by six foot slabs. The plan set was 10 pages, okay? So yeah, maybe it's a new technology to certain agencies, but, but once an agency gets comfortable with concrete overlays, um, the project development and engineering is, is pretty straightforward. I mean, we do not need hundreds of sheets of, of plans to go build a 23 mile long county road. It's doable with, with only the information you need. I mean, here's, here's an outline, here's station to station, here's the typical section. Make sure you get people in and out of their house. That, that's, that's about all it takes. Next page. So zero pre-overlay repairs on this old old roadway, okay? Just, and, and no milling. So whatever was there got overlaid with four inches of concrete. Now, obviously it's not, you know, not high volumes of traffic, but I will tell you the, the loads from the agricultural equipment up here are not light. Um, so again, it, it just did not require any pre-overlay repairs. Closed it to through traffic, kept it open to, to property owners, and then, Again, 23 miles, 110 calendar days, and that roadway's gone from old asphalt pavement to new concrete overlay, open for the full length. Next slide. All right, the last job, and um, you see quite a few of these. Now, not not always an unbonded like like is presented here, but this is a uh, an urban intersection in Salina, Kansas. Um, built in 2012. So it, it, for Salina, this is the busiest intersection in town. What was interesting, they actually had in their, their kind of infrastructure plan, another intersection that was going to be reconstructed in the following year. And they knew they needed to do something with this one before that next project. So what do we do? What can we do kind of short time frame? What can we do without disrupting uh, forever? What's going on with, with the businesses around here? And a concrete on asphalt, unbonded design was the solution. Now it does happen to be an existing composite pavement. So with the, the new terminology, the fact that it's composite, we just call it concrete on asphalt. And this one happens to be unbonded. They did some partial depth milling. So if you've ever done any work on, on an urban intersection, you know we've got a jillion things that we have to come back and match elevation with, whether it's curb and gutter, whether it's utilities, whatever it is, um, we, we're pretty much locked into whatever elevation we were at. So the approach was partial depth mill, what was there, place an eight inch thick JPCP with 12 foot by 12 foot slabs. Next slide. Maintenance, uh, maintenance of traffic on this one is really just like you build any other intersection. I mean, you're staging it by quadrant. 
and maintaining traffic all times during construction. Uh, you might limit the turning movement now and then, but um, you know, same as you'd stage any intersection uh, construction. The entire thing completed in 45 days, you kind of see a before and after. So next slide. Um, those are the project highlights. And, and, I, and I really hope, again, that they just kind of remind you of projects you've ever had in the past and say, hey, we might have been able to do a concrete overlay there, or you're looking at something in the future and possibly a concrete overlay is, is a potential solution for that upcoming project. Um, that's the idea here. We don't want to get into the weeds about, you know, what are the design details? Uh, how thick does it need to be? What's the fiber dosage? Uh, a lot of that information, in fact, there's there's just a ton of resources available at the CP Tech Center, at FHWA, DOT. Um, you'll just find tons and tons of resources related to concrete overlays. I encourage you to check them all out. Next slide. Shri, it's back to you. All right, thank you very much, Gary. That was an excellent presentation. And uh, it really shows uh, the different ways you can do concrete overlays in different situations. So it, it really covered many different uh, types of concrete overlays and it was exciting to see all of those uh, different projects. Um, again, uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, please type it in the chat board and I'll have uh, Peter and Gary uh, answer those questions. And uh, there's a few questions already uh, on the chat board. I'm, I'm gonna ask those questions until we see for more questions. The uh, first one is from Bob Hackman who says, won't IJA, I guess that's the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, provide some funds for use in looking at concrete overlays? Uh, this is probably not a question for Peter or Gary. I don't know if Sam, you wanna take this question? Peter, do you know anything about the IIJ? <laughs> I was kind of hoping Sam was going to pick that one. <laughs> um, I don't know a lot about it. Um, I was actually looking to see if life was on, but he's not here either. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure that I fully understand the question. I'm pretty sure that there will be concrete overlays built using IIJA funds, um, depending on how the states tackle it. I'm not sure that any of that money would be available for investigation or promotion, but you know that's the activity that you're doing under the TOPS program and that we're doing under our cooperative agreement is providing the resources to help the agencies. Uh, so two answers to one question, Gary. Yeah, no, I, I, I really can't provide anything that uh, of, of meaningful help regarding that. Okay, it's probably more a comment than a question. Um, the next question is from Thomas Tate. Um, he asks, how is widening accomplished? Uh, Gary, do you wanna talk about widening of uh, a roadway when you do concrete overlays? Yeah, I can briefly. And, and I, I will say it's one of the most challenging parts of overlays when, uh, when we try to tackle kind of integral widening with an overlay, things can get complicated pretty quickly. Um, there's some, some good guidance in couple of the resources, uh, first being guide to overlays, the other being, um, gosh, I've forgotten the title, the plan details one, Peter, that uh, Jared and I worked on. Um, but anyway, it goes through some, some pretty good details on, on how you would approach widening um, integral with a concrete overlay. Uh, but again, it, it, is, it is sometimes one of the more complicated things we do. So if, if it's your first overlay, Maybe you look for one that's a little easier, but uh, it, it's been done a lot, so it can be uh, it can be designed around. And, and again, the devil is in the details. Is it worth going back slide seven? We actually had a photograph of a widening happening. Yeah, we did. Um, I'm not sure that matches up with the current um, kind of guidelines for okay. you know reinforcement of a of a um, integral widening. Uh, and there are some drainage considerations as well. In fact, I, I think that that photo, Peter, came from when we learned a couple lessons on. If that makes sense. <laughs> All right, no, we won't go back to it then. <laughs> um, okay, thank you, Gary, Peter. Um, Bob Hackman has a comment about uh, the American Concrete Payment Association has 
a national map of overlay. So if anybody wants to check that out, um, you can go to ACPA's website. Um, there's a question here from C. Lutens. Um, working on project that is adding a third lane to existing two lane uh, each direction interstate, considering using PCC pavement section for third lane and PCC overlay of two existing HMA lanes. What is your advice, example, tied, untied wedge mill to match PCC thickness for longitudinal joint between new PCC auxiliary lane and PCC overlay? So Gary, I'm not sure you got that, but uh, essentially how do you tie a new PCC lane to an overlay PCC lane? Yeah. Um... So it's similar to a project I, I did back in 98, I think, um, 96 maybe, where we had existing four-lane facility. We did an unbonded overlay on the existing um, lanes and then widened both to the inside and outside uh, with additional lane and shoulder. Um, I would say tie them just as you would um, if you were if all of them were from ground up uh, new concrete pavement. Um, because what you're looking at, that concrete on the existing asphalt that's an overlay, uh, that asphalt is is simply a, a sub-base course. It's there as support. You want to be um, a little bit aware of, of what movement might take place between placement of, unless you're placing it all at the same time, 36 foot wide, say, uh, what movement might, might take place between the, the construction of the separate lanes. But I would say tie it just as you would. Um, any other concrete pavement. Peter, is there anything you wanted to add to that in terms of the movement uh, and the friction, different friction you have between the different uh, sub, um, support conditions? Yeah, I'm semi-wondering how much, yeah, th they are going to move differently. And so you may want to consider how you can allow them to move without causing faulting. Um, I'd be reluctant to tie them together too tight because I suspect you'd get some cracking coming through. Okay, thank you, both Peter and Gary. Um, John Sudeik Sude asks, could Eric please uh, place last slide? E Eric, can you just move back one slide that, so people can look at the resources page? Um, here's another question. Um, is there a maximum traffic or ESA limit where you should no longer consider bonded overlay and use unbonded instead. Um, and the question further says, ACPA guide to concrete overlay reference suggests only up to 15 million ESAs for bonded. Uh, Peter, you wanna take that? Uh, I'll defer to Gary. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think rather than theory, let, let's, and I, you know, I'm gonna get way out of my, uh, area of expertise with design but what's going to happen is if you have a a facility with with millions and millions and millions of easels you are going to end up with a thickness of overlay which it doesn't matter if you bond or unbond so you might as well call it an unbonded if that makes sense i mean once you get above six inches of thickness um any any contribution you're getting by bonding to the layer below is is negligible um that that upper slab the overlay slab is carrying all the load so i think it's just going to be driven by the easels and the thickness of the, the pavement you end up with um and if you don't have to bond don't bond i would agree with that all right thank you Gary. um uh, Greg Dean asked, was this presentation recorded and will it be available for others to see? I can answer that question. Yes, it is recorded uh, and it will be posted on Feral Highway's website. Oh. God, let me see now. Okay, I think we changed that. Um, Greg Dean asks, on the thinner asphalt overlays, the six by six sections, should the joints be sealed? or left unsealed opinion? Pete, I'll you wanna take a stab at that? I'll start. I think they should be filled. Uh, the reason being that if you leave the joint unsealed and water is able to transfer through the joint, you increase the risk of stripping of the asphalt below the concrete. And then you've got a support issue. 
and you, you may have a failure because the concrete's got nothing to sit on. So, you know, seal or fill, <clears throat> you know, it's another debate altogether, but I would like to keep the water out of the system. I agree. Uh, and, and I guess I'd, I'd add just a little bit. I mean, so if you go back to the very prehistory of, of thin concrete overlays where we ended up with these small slab sizes, the approach was not to seal. Um, and we've learned plenty of lessons, especially in wet freestyle environments, that uh, the benefit of filling those joints um, is worth the cost of filling those joints. If you're not in a, a wet freestyle environment, I think we've also seen some lessons learned with just simply filling of incompressibles in those joints and uh, some premature uh, distress. So I would agree, fill the joints. Okay, thank you both Peter and Gary. Uh, I, I did wanna mention to the participants, uh, apparently there was some kind of glitch in today's program and the number of participants were somehow limited to uh, 100. So if if those of you who have colleagues or or friends or uh, or peers who try to get in and could not get in, uh, please let them know that they can access the recording on Federal Highway's website when this is posted. Uh, we will also send an email to everyone uh, regarding that and apologizing for uh, that snafu. Um, Greg Lyons asks, how do you deal with structural deficiencies that may exist in an asphalt pavement? or maybe even PCC. So I guess, how do you prepare the existing roadway prior to an overlay? Gary, Gary you want to start? You take, you start. Okay, I'll start. Sorry, I was waiting for you, Peter. Um, <laughs> all right, so I guess a couple things, and these are these are rules of thumb, you know, taught to me by others and, and um, one way to look at this, you know, pre-overlay repairs, how extensive do we need to be? And, and I would, if you're in the situation of an unbonded overlay, right, then you need to think of that existing pavement is a sub-base only, and it's carrying traffic every day. So unless you have literally a isolated failure, um, in most cases, you can get by with very few uh, pre-overlay repairs. If, if you, view, you have areas, that are, you know, say it's it's an existing concrete pavement and the slab is, you know, already broken into three pieces and you're seeing movement under traffic of that slab, that needs to be repaired. What you need to think about when you're doing these pre-overlay prayers or, or identifying those areas where you have failures, uh, nine times out of 10, it's a subgrade failure. So a simple patch may not just be the answer. You, you're probably gonna have to do some subgrade and base uh, remediation along with pavement patch before the overlay. Peter, anything to add to that? Uh, not really. There is a document out there that uh, Dale Harrington wrote. Um, I think you were a co-author on it, Gary, for Minnesota DOT. Um, I'll send a link to, uh, to you guys. You can circulate it. Thank you, Gary and Peter. Um, Eric Flocchini, Flocchini um, asked, what process is in place to deal with overlays when overhead clearance is already extremely limited at various locations within the project limits? Um, Gary, you wanna take that on and talk a little yeah. bit about overhead clearance? Sure, so guide to overlays and a couple of the other resources that you can find on this, these links that you're seeing on the screen right now uh, does a very good job of describing what those transitions need to look like. So where you are where you have limited um, overhead clearance, uh, you're probably in the situation where you're gonna have to do some length of reconstruction uh, underneath that to at least either maintain what clearance is there or improve the clearance that's there and then transition back to the overlay on the other side of the, uh, the structure. But those details are all in the, these, these resources here. And, and again, the, the length of that transition is going to depend on how thick the overlay is and, and how many inches you're making up uh, through that uh, area. Um, Peter, here's a question that uh, is 
probably for you. Can an overlay be installed over an existing cold mix pavement with a tar and chip seal surface? Probably. Um, again, we may want to have a look at it and see whether or not we want to put a debonding layer in, but yeah, I don't see why not. Gary, have you seen uh, a lot of overlays on chip seal surfaces or some cold mix pavements? I'm trying to recall a, a couple that I can, in my memory, um, uh, I'm with Peter, depending on what the, the chip seal's like and, and you know how much sub-base friction you've got there during the early age of that pavement, you might want to have to consider something there, but uh, no, I don't see any issue, other issue with that. I, I, I think, I believe I have seen it in South Africa where they were putting high performance concrete on top of chip seal. Uh, Bob Hackman has a comment here, uh, and maybe that's a question. Doesn't pavementdesigner.com website allow for overlay designs? I think it does, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, uh, again, um, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So yeah, I would like to thank the presenters, uh, Sam Tyson, of course, to uh, for introducing the top program and tops program, uh, Peter Taylor and Gary Frick for their great uh, presentations and also answering the Q and A sessions. Um, here's the full series of the eight webinars. I encourage you to go register for these upcoming webinars on the tops website or uh, or when you get the email uh, for the tops webinars. The next um, six are alternating um, asphalt with concrete webinars. Since you attended the concrete webinar, I'd like to point out that webinar four, six, and eight will go into some more detail on uh, some of these specific technologies. And we will uh, bring in some state DOTs to talk about their experiences with those specific uh, types of overlays. Um, and so uh, stay tuned for those webinars. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and if you want to get the link to those webinars, uh, please sign up for EC News and Innovator uh, or um, text FHW Innovation to 468311 or go to uh, Innovation website and you can sign up for these and, uh, and then you can get updates and whenever uh, materials are developed and posted to Federal Highway's website and things like that, uh, you'll get some updates uh, if you sign up for these things. Again, thank you everyone for attending the webinar. Thank you for our speakers and apologize for the snafu in terms of the number of registrants. Um, thank you again and have a great rest of your afternoon.